Okay. No, I, 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 just to say, I thought the, there was so much crisscrossing, in a way, between we'll those two house. talks <laughs> that was really interesting, and I'd love to hear your, how each, each of you fe felt. I mean, they're both the questions, the questions of... Uh, Joyce's questions, in a way, of, of autobiography as a form of endless disguise, <laughs> where there is no, in the end, it's like there is no person yeah. <laughs> there. And, and your sense that there's a person who's not fully there because she's not, she doesn't want to be yeah. <laughs> fully there. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's a huge amount of history in both of these cases, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, a, and a kind of a negotiation with history. I'd love to hear you, you know, both of you talk a little, actually talk, ask each other questions or talk to us all, whichever you like. Well, I, I guess I'm struck by the different eras um, in which people tell their life story. Yeah. Um, and uh, it also strikes me uh, that Franklin covered his family very briefly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then on to himself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big contrast. Again, since we don't know whether he might have revised it to give more of his family background, who knows? Um, I think probably not, but he wasn't writing to look back um, necessarily about his ancestry um, and the longer history of colonization um, and the Protestant Reformation and all the things he might have regarded as important developments. Um, uh, so that's uh, both the sense that writing, life writing in his era was different from what it oh, would yeah. be now. Mm -hmm. and he would have absolutely respected that sense of privacy that why do you want to tell everyone everything? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think he might have felt violated by having his autobiography represented as that mm -hmm. in the French edition. Mm -hmm. um, but then also he was not as interested in his family background and as generous about thinking of his place and time as you obviously were in your book. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yes, I'm a product of the post, the, the sort of new biography, which is when you're looking at not just the, the things that the public person did, but a very strong mm. attention to the interior right. of your life. And this is post-Freud and all of this kind of thing. So I, I, I'm writing at a time when people tell all is literally what people do. And um, it's, it's amazing. I, I, the only book that I've listened to that I've managed to get through on Audible is a book called Spare by oh my God. Chris Harris. <laughs> I actually listened to the entire thing. Uh, and I just thought, this is amazing. I mean, you know, he's, he tells a lot of things about himself and about his family that I just probably would not, I probably is not right. <laughs> I, I would definitely not do. No, I mean, it's not bad, but it's just a different era. For yeah, Franklin, yeah. that would be inconceivable. I mean, Jefferson... When someone wrote to him asking him for the names of his grandchildren because they were writing a biography of him, and he wrote back and said, why do you need to know the names of my grandchildren? Mm. What does that have, basically, what does that have to do with my life? Surely you're writing about me as a public person, <laughs> not about, you know, that kind of thing. He said, that would bore people, mm. you know, huh. for me to do that and to write that kind of thing. So we're in a very different set of expectations, but I, I think the as I was, what I meant to say is that that kind of writing, the kind of bearing your soul, I'm, I'm not prepared to do it even as a novelist, which I think novelists mind their families and so forth, and that's one reason I'm, I would be terrible at it and not good at it, because I just, just because you're related to someone, why does that mean that you, they get to be dragged <laughs> into mm. your public story of your life? But you're, they are part of your life, but to my mind, I, I had to find some way that balanced um, privacy for them, you know, and, and my parents aren't living, as I said. Maybe, how do I know? Maybe they would be happy if I talked more about their lives because they're, they're out there. But I, since they're not here to make that decision, I decided to, to err on the side mm. of being, being reticent. Mm. I mean, sometimes with Franklin, I do wonder, I wish I knew more about something or other. And I don't know whether you felt that um, in terms of how you wanted to talk about your family in Texas where there were gaps or silences that you oh, thought yes, were particularly Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's made me want to go back. It's strange for a person who writes about other people's families. I haven't, I mean, I know my family history pretty well, 
but I'm not into it. Mm. You know, the way some people are very much into genealogy and their families and so forth. But I think it's made me a bit more. I'd like to know um, a bit more. I, I remember as a kid going with my grandparent, my grandmother and her sister to Madison, Texas. And I had no idea why we were there. There were some people they knew there. But when I was doing this book, I found out the great-great-grandfather that I, whose name I found on the list lived in Madison. Hmm. So Madison was a part of our family that I, you know, I just thought it was some random town mm. <laughs> that they went to. I didn't know how important it actually was. And um, so those kinds of things I'd like to, I might like to go back and clear up, even if I don't write about it. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm very struck by the, the, the sense of, um, of, of disguise and mythology in the midst of history mm -hmm. here. That they were, but where, where if we think about, you know, if we think naively and straightforwardly about autobiography, we think, oh, I'm going to tell the story of myself and I know who I am. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a lot of reasons for doubting. Oh, this. yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that yes that's that we definitely know true. Who we are. But also, and so that would be personal, the question of there's a kind of strange self-confidence that, that I can tell all, uh, that it seems based on a sort of fallacy that I know all, which I probably don't. Oh, absolutely. Don't. <laughs> right. I mean, this, this is the kind of thing that if I were writing about the Hemingses or Jefferson, some of the things that I say, I would, if I were standing outside myself, I would go and want to unpack yeah. and say, <laughs> you know, no, I know that's the story you're telling about your family, but actually. Um, <laughs> and, and I have those stories, too, that I yeah. repeat in the book. But this is, as long as you kn the, right, the reader knows that this is your memoir, that now you're engaging in memoir, you're, they're forewarned, yeah. I guess. To say. Yeah, this yeah, is the best good. of, this, these are the family stories that were told to me, yeah. and, you know, I'm not approaching them in a scholarly way. It would have taken me far longer to write this book. It would be a much longer book than it was if I actually were going at it the way I went at Jefferson and Hemings. Yeah, that's fantastic. And also, so, and the, so part of it would be the person, the, 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 this a kind of dream of knowing who I am and what I am, being able to tell it, so I kind of, a, a, a dream of self-understanding, self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, the other half is, is the public myth, how, like, the, like w what is Texas? Mm -hmm. What kind of place is that? What, what kind of history is that? And the same would be, Franklin, I think, would be engaged with some of that question mm -hmm. of history itself. I mean, this is, this is a kind of rather, it's a kind of deeply unscientific thing to say, I think, but history cannot be understood except as a pack of lies, in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and that we have to understand how the lies work mm -hmm. rather than, rather well, than I the, the facts. Say I don't know, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit crude. Maybe misrepresent the misrepresentations, because lying, I think, implies intent. Yeah, okay. And yeah. sometimes people are lying, often <laughs> people are lying, but sometimes people just don't, they don't know. I mean, this is the best that they come up with. This is, this is the information they have. They have no reason to doubt it. Yeah. And they pull it together. I mean, like these people who do these DNA tests of folks, and when they do them, they always separate, them, separate people out. Yeah. And so that when somebody finds out that their father isn't really their father, they don't, there's no way to know that. that you, you know, there's just some mistake here. We don't know who it is. You know, people go on the information that's told them. And so working on the Hemings is what I had to do. When Madison Hemings says Jefferson was my father, I couldn't just accept that. You have to go around it yeah. and find things. But you don't have to. I didn't feel I had to do that with my book because yeah. it's not that kind of book. Yeah, with, with Franklin, I think it's not so much lies he tells as what he puts in and leaves out. Okay. <laughs> um, and his awareness, I mean, he was writing his memoirs when everyone kept reading the experiments and observations on electricity, and I think he thought it would be tacky, <laughs> therefore, to mention that a lot. Um, that was really bragging about something everyone already knew about. Well, people now don't read the <laughs> experiments and observations on electricity, and um, the modest way in which he didn't put all the science and his mm -hmm. accomplishments and his fame in his autobiography now give a definite... Um, sense of his public life um, mm. uh, as a printer, you know, in politics, uh, leaving out the more intellectual work. I always point out that um, on his final Atlantic journey, coming back from France, going home to Philadelphia the last time, he knows he has a little time to write. Uh, he doesn't get seasick. Oh, I'm so envious. Um, 
<laughs> and so he, at sea, he, he writes a lot, and he, but he knows he's running out of time. Um, and he thinks, well, I could write more of the memoirs, or I could write these two scientific articles. And he does the right thing, and he writes the scientific articles. Mm. And every scientist and historian of science I say this to is like, right! <laughs> um, and all the scholars of literature are like, oh, what a loss. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but that shows his own priorities, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that is really what he was banking on, keeping his name in circulation, giving him the long kind of um, imprint on his culture. And that's true, but then you read the autobiography and it's invisible. It's invisible stuff. No. It's, hard, it's hard to conceive of anybody doing that today, however. I can't speak for scientists now. <laughs> <laughs> Might make that decision. Well, who were as famous as he, you know? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think he... Mm, I think he thought that science was really taking off in new directions yeah. right at the end of his life, and he was afraid that political career had gotten in the way, yeah. and um, he had some final things to say. I mean, it is, I, I think of the American Revolution as something that derails Benjamin Franklin's real goals in life. Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, it was very consequential, everything he did, um, but he means, you know, people identifying oxygen and, and figuring out photosynthesis, and he's done on sidelines, and yeah. I don't think yeah. he likes that. Yeah. Michael, we Annie. have about um, four or five minutes before we really should go to break. Would you like to maybe open the floor yeah, up to the that, audience? That's and, a very nice because I think there's some questions. Yep. Sure. Yeah, okay. There's great lots idea. of yeah. lots of questions. So um, I tell you, let me questions. let me start with uh, with Richard Kagan Richard. over here. Richard Kagan here. Thank you both for uh, uh, <laughs> hi Joyce. Congratulations. Um, I like to. Uh, this question is really for Joyce. Uh, in the middle of, uh, I think Franklin started writing in the early seventies in his autobiography. In 1782, a man called Jean-Jacques Rousseau <laughs> writes his Confessions, which is the kind of tell-all uh, autobiography pre-Freud. And he, he, <laughs> you, you squirm when you read it. It's not an. It's he, he telling things about himself that perhaps Franklin never wanted to say, or perhaps your parents or grandparents didn't want to say either. But was Franklin at all influenced by c c uh, that kind of autobiographical writing? He probably read The Social Contract, I assume. Yeah. But what about The Confessions, which in a sense is uh, it, it's, a, it's so interiorized yeah. and, and yet philosophical. And so that part of it, the didactic sense, is in the confessions, but the autobiographical, the truly, or the ego writing is, is seems to be absent in the, mm. uh, in the, in the Franklin. Right, because Franklin started uh, his memoirs before. Um, he, it couldn't have been an original model for him, and it's not clear whether he ever read it. Um, so um, his awareness, however, I mean, he, he, he is aware other people, you know, talk about themselves a lot. Um, and he um, kind of remarks on people having emotional lives. <laughs> that he just doesn't, you know, that's fine for them. Um, they lo <laughs> um, it's, he's not saying he doesn't have one, um, but, you know, going on and on and on about it and being emotionally attached to I mean, he has all these friends who have pets, and he's like, okay, I get that that makes them happy. <laughs> <laughs> so he just, you know, a lot of the, other than the science, a lot of the kind of modernization trends about self and personhood and emotions, mm -hmm. he knows it's going on, but it's not the way he thinks about himself. Or he's not comfortable thinking about himself in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hi. Yeah. Uh, Nili Cohen from uh, Tel Aviv University. Thank you very much for your uh, brilliant uh, lecture and discussion. And I would like to ask you whether you, see, you think there is a, any difference between uh, biographies, autobiographies, and uh, novels. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. I would like to refer to, to an example, Karl Ove Knausgaard, uh. uh, <laughs> the Norwegian uh, writer who details his life, but it, it, it is considered a wonderful um, novel, and uh, if I may be more concrete, do you think that in a mere novel, 
imagination can play a great role. Uh, whereas in biography or autobiography, the commitment to truth is almost absolute. <laughs> you know, well, I think, I think imagination is a part of biography and autobiography. Yeah, it's a part of history, too. I mean, mm. it's, it has to, it doesn't mean imagination isn't always just making things up. I think it has to be, it's inspiration, it's a way of connecting to readers. Uh, yeah. No, I think, mm -hmm. it, I think it's, that's, that's good. I, maybe I'm not a novelist, but maybe On Juneteenth is like a novel <laughs> in the sense that, uh, as, I've, as I've said, I'm telling the story from my perspective and so forth with historical novels have truthful things in them as well. You know, mm -hmm. they, put, they pull things together. I think it may, I don't know, I would fall into, as a lawyer, I would say maybe this is about intent uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, be, although we can't say that Rousseau was an inspiration or model for Franklin, Daniel Defoe definitely was. Mm -hmm. um, and if you read, yeah. especially the kind of running away and wanting to go to sea and all the kind of you're like, oh, I think I've read this book before. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and the, behind that, the whole kind of picaresque um, tradition of writing mm -hmm. about especially young men's lives. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. On the road. And, yeah. But that's why I think readers read that first part and, ah, here we, I know where I am with this story. And then it goes into the committee work, <laughs> 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 which is... Um, um, I don't know who the best novelist of that is, <laughs> but it would be a different genre. But that is, you know, I think that is where Franklin becomes himself, mm -hmm. more mm. genuinely. Right. Some other back, Lee? Okay, terrific. Thank you. Well, I didn't raise my hand, but our host just put this microphone in my hand. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's because I spent all my life looking into Frederick Douglass's autobiographies. I guess the question is mostly for Annette, but really for both of you, who I admire both of you so much. Annette, please write another, <laughs> <laughs> but beware. Mm -hmm. Because you are a writer, and beware of people like us down the road who are going to try to test accuracy and facts and I mean a lot of us have spent our lives trying to figure out where Frederick Douglass was lying and where he wasn't mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or where he was making it up and where he wasn't mm -hmm. uh, only to find out that he got almost all of the basic details right mm -hmm. and then he just became the genius writer that he was mm -hmm. so are you yet aware of how people are going to examine your autobiography. <laughs> I haven't thought about that. No, no, actually, I, I have We're training thought. the people who are going to do it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> people are going to do it. No, that, that is a part of it, certainly. That is something to be wary of. And if, you know, people pay attention to what I've written in the past, I'm, I'm much more interested in what happens with the, the Hemingses and Jeffersons and that side of it. Um, yeah, but I know Bob Weil, and he's not going to give up on you. I know, he won't. He will not. He will not. I, I will think about doing it. I will think about doing it. I'll think about doing even a big book about Texas without myself in it. Hmm. But you'd have to be in it. I'd have to be in it. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the point where, thank you so much. This is just fabulous. So let's, uh, let's take a break. Congratulations. Fantastic. Thank you. Again, I, I, there are lots of crisscrossings between that. I want to ask Leonard and, and Ivana to say something about where they meet and not me, but just a, I, I've been hesitating about this, but I, I'm going to invite an, another speaker to, the, uh, to, to our session. This one is dead and can't actually be here. His name is Jorge Luis Borges. And he, uh, he, ever since we've been thinking, since Caroline suggested this program, this little it's a, sh it's a very short story, a little fable, been running my mind, and I, th I think it actually fits in with these discussions we've, we've been having. It's, it was written in 1960, and it's, from, it's the epilogue to a book called The Maker, El Asador. It's, it's, this is the complete paragraph. A man, it has to be a man, these were the 
1960s. <laughs> there, there, were, there, weren't, there weren't any women then in, Argen, in, in, in Argen, Argentina. So I'm, and this is my translation. Uh, a man sets himself the task of sketching the world. As years go by, he peoples the space with images of provinces, kingdoms, mountains, bays, ships, islands, fishes, dwellings, instruments, stars, horses, and persons. Shortly before he dies, he discovers that this patient labyrinth of lines traces the image of his own face. Oh, we can thank Borges for his contribution to this. <laughs> but but um, I, I felt I, I, I'm not sure which way this goes into that, <laughs> which, which way it takes it. But, but Ivana, and Lan, would, you, would you react a little bit to what your, either your own thoughts, or further thoughts, or to each other's? Um, well, I, I was delighted that even I mentioned the great uh, uh, symposium meeting we had in, at Itati, uh, <clears throat> where besides ourselves, we all were asked to present a text, yeah. um, and that in a, uh, and it was a, it was a star-studded. I mean, I was the schlepper of the group. It was a, a truly star-studded assemblage of people, um, but uh, the sort of the text that we were not only presenting ourselves, but ourselves via a text which we didn't write. Um, and uh, uh, I chose a text by uh, Panofsky uh, 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 on a, what seemed like a very non-first-person subject that proves to be a very much a first-person subject. <clears throat> so I think we always, uh, as critics, as creative writers, we always find uh, that face, uh, mm -hmm. or others can find, others find our, face. our face mm -hmm. in what we do. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the idea, but in, and in your, in your book, in a very explicit way, but it's, yeah. you know, it's an, it's an, it's a, it's, a, it's also an indis, in, indirect autobiography in many ways. It's a, it's a, through the other, through the what right. you perceive, of uh, what you read of Shakespeare, mm -hmm. that you you discover yourself. Right. So, uh, the, the 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 at the same symposium, the text that I gave to read was a. a, a and a, uh, he's not French. He was a Romanian art historian, but he was he was speaking French. Uh, called Robert Klein, whose work has been translated into English a, a few texts, and that's a text I, I I gave to read because it's a text I read as a teenager and that you know changed my life in the sense that I stopped wanting to be an artist and decided <laughs> I would maybe try to be an art historian, but but it decided <laughs> it was not the case either. But anyway, <laughs> so it was through this text that I made. I, re I realized something of myself, and, and, and just by giving this text to read, uh, I, was, I was giving a, a part of me, you know, in a way. So, so. Mm. I, I, I'm struck by what, what, what you're saying now, taking us back to, to what Annette and, and, and jo Joyce are saying, to how all this discussion of the self is so often about the other. Yeah. And, and how much I'm just thinking about, about Franklin's performances, and I'm thinking about uh, and that your, your, the family and, and history, mm -hmm. this sort of. Uh, uh, would you like to say a little bit more about how the how the self gets into history and history gets into the, into no, the it's, self? It's, so I mean, that's a real topic, in mm -hmm. fact. And, and, and uh, it, it, there is a. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I've never read, unfortunately, uh, uh, Franklin's autobiography, so I don't know the way it, it's it happens in his text. But you know. I don't think it's possible today to just write an autobiography. Say, I was born in that date, and you know, to, to, it's, I, I don't think it would no. be credible. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that we define, uh, we construct ourselves as subjects through our understanding of others, and mm. so that's mm. that's why the, the self become very very quickly a subject, uh, historical subject. Mm. So, mm. among other things, but. Mm. And it certainly some shows itself in the tendency of people to identify. Could yeah. come to identify with the person yeah. about whom they're writing, yeah. or, or you know, love the person or hate the person. You know, there's a genre of hate <laughs> you know, writing about people. Um, yeah, you do see yourself in the person, and you see. You, sometimes you say you recoil from that and say I'm the opposite of it and don't want to be associated with it. But you do make those points of connections yeah. all the time, yeah. which is tough. You know, I'm writing about Jefferson. And I'm writing about a white man of the 18th century who was a slave owner who had many things about him 
that I do feel a connection to, love and reading, all those kinds of things. Yeah. But other stuff that's just, you know, wow, uh, yeah. no, that's not me. <laughs> uh, uh, that, it, it, and I think it, 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 it affects what people <coughs> view you, because yeah. I, I think a lot of the, the issue that people had back in 1997 when my first book came out was, you know, can I write about this person? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's a subject now that's, yeah. because that people assume that there has to be some, yeah. you have to be, yeah. if not the same, but kind of the same before, before you to do justice to someone's writing. Here's an autobiographical question. How did you come to? How did I, <laughs> how did you come to Jefferson? How did I, how did I come to Jefferson? <laughs> yeah. um, in the third grade. Okay. Oh, that's <laughs> <my gosh. laughs> I read a child's biography of Jefferson when I was in the third grade, wow. and uh, they had a series of books by famous people, Washington, you know, George Washington Carver and all, you know, people like that. And his was back there, and his was the one that interested me the most because, you know, it, it tells tells me, you know, that he wrote the Declaration of Independence, but he was also the master of Monticello. So that kind of paradox, mm -hmm. even at that age, interested me. That's very yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's always been important to me in this discourse that <clears throat> that there's something. You know, you're not supposed to be an egotist. I mean, that, mm -hmm. you sort of, that's a rule of life. Mm -hmm. uh, but we all are. Uh, <laughs> that's a rule of life. Um, uh, and, uh, and that, it, you know, sub specie reading, I mean, it's sort of my profession as a literary scholar, um, it's clear that the, the place to take that uh, rule is to say, uh, this reading is about the other. Uh, I'm yeah. privileged to sit in the audience of it, uh, but, uh, but I'm not supposed to be thinking about myself. I can't resist thinking about myself, but I'm not supposed to be. And sort of it's that, um, you know, it's sort of childhood release that I wanted mm -hmm. to enact. Mm -hmm. Saying, God damn it, um, or even some nastier expletive. Uh, <laughs> I, I am thinking about myself when mm -hmm. I try to understand what Gertrude means when she says, <laughs> Methinks the thinks. lady doth protest too yeah. much. Yeah. Um, That's and that, you know, they're just trying to unpack that, which I think is impossible to unpack. Yeah. Um, uh, and, it, and, it, and it sort of becomes an expression, as is the case with To the Manor Born, the other, you know, these become expressions that are removed from their, uh, from their Hamlet's context and sort of used to mean a lot of various things. That <clears throat> and, you know, where am I in that, uh, uh, you know, expression? Uh, and, you know, in fact, is, I mean, Gertrude is saying um, that la the lady should shut up or so, something like that. She yeah. shouldn't be uh, exposing herself that much or uh, whatever, you know, that, that, that this is something shameful uh, and that books are the other. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're, uh, we are meant to keep our distance. Yeah. I said, no, I don't think so. It also, it also by, kind of, by kind of paradox, it, it suggests, doesn't it, that... The, the, the most objective writers, if there is such a thing, in this thing are novelists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because they've actually externalized and moved it and removed it from the self. I mean, this isn't true, but I think, but I think that whole business about autofiction, mm -hmm. where mm. it's actually autofiction is in one, is, you know, it's a very fashionable name for fiction, but it, it would once have simply been the name, for, the ordinary name for a bad novel. <laughs> you, you wrote your own life because you didn't have enough imagination to get out of it, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I think great novelists often have very quite remote from mm -hmm. from the world of confession. I think, mm -hmm. but you, know, you don't always know. But I mean, I think that seems an interesting thing. And uh, Joyce, I'm interested where, where Franklin. I, see, I, I, I'm seeing Franklin as a kind of uh, author of works of fiction in the middle of this <laughs> the story. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yes, again, all the fables he tells with. Um, under pseudonyms. Uh, he's a, a very good fiction writer. Um, mm. And I don't know, I, I think that when I read the autobiography, I can't read it anymore. I don't know how people feel about texts you studied and studied and studied <laughs> yeah, and taught. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see certain things in it anymore. But um, the, <clears throat> the way he's an excellent storyteller does kind of trip me up because yeah. I think, yeah. huh, <laughs> um, this is a very dramatic... Um, scenario in which he's the star. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and that's where I think, well, parts of it might be true. Um, uh, and it's very interesting to read. I am always now kind of reconstruct everyone else around him. Um, mm -hmm. And that is the part of the storytelling that I think is 
um, really compelling, is figuring out who these people were. <laughs> um, is he describing them accurately? Rarely. <laughs> Um, and uh, do we really know um, uh, a lot about them from what he says? Um, hmm. Sometimes you can check this against other historical records, yeah. and that um, allows mm -hmm. some specificity um, to be borne out. Um, but some things, I, I actually like that we don't know everything about the past, and this may be a personal taste. Um, <laughs> but I actually think it's great when uh, people kept secrets. Um, so we don't know um, the mother of Franklin's uh, illegitimate son, and I'm kind of congratulating those people who kept that quiet, you know? Um, <laughs> there's um, very interesting, in the shop book um, kept for the Franklin's print shop, there's an account where the name is My Mad Men. <laughs> I don't know whether anyone's ever gotten to the bottom of who this person was, but he was given credit. <laughs> on that account, my madman, and we don't know who that was. <laughs> that would, I think well, that would we like to know, wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> that would, it, we would it like could have been, it's in Deborah Franklin's hands, so it could have been a joke about the guy yeah. she married, in yeah. fact. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perhaps we could, uh, we could uh, get some questions, comments from, from uh, our friends. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. John Friedman from New York. I have three quick questions. One, what do you think the omnipresence of photographs and videos, mm -hmm. what impact will that have on the future of memoir? And two, what, how would you differentiate diaristic writing from memoir? And then the third, from your Borges story, <laughs> is there any kind of relationship between self-portraiture and memoir? Thoughts. <laughs> well, the, the, I mean, the, the the diary and the memoir. Uh, it, it's a different. It's a diff The author has a different position. In a, in a diary, in pre you know, most diaries are not written immediately to be published. Uh, well, Gide was, but that's a kind of exception in the mm. in the world of diaries. Uh, so there's there's a kind of immediacy, supposedly immediacy. So the the idea that the narrator and uh, and the subject of the action is the same person is much more easy to accept in the diary than in than uh, than in memoir because in the memoir there is a distance of of time and there is uh, the capacity of the for the writer to have reconstruct his or her uh, you know life in in a appropriate uh, timely uh, teleological manner so I, I think that's all that that's a slight difference of position with regard to the what the reader would be that's uh, I wonder if I could respond to the first of those questions. I, I spent a lot of my scholarly time on the relation between uh, paint, poetry and painting and words and images, <clears throat> and I find it very telling that this self-presentation of Montaigne at the beginning is first, uh, he refers to this, what he's done, as a portrait, and then he extends so that the idea of the portrait of, and the self-portrait uh, stands as some sort of authentic copy, which is itself, of course, as people always point out, that authentic copy is an ask oxymoron. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, that that's the, the real thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, what it says on, on the first folio with under the picture of Shakespeare, after the authentic copies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, that that's for the word person. Um, there's this... Uh, Drang, you know, it's this, this wish to be a picture person, uh, as though the picture um, uh, presents something more absolute and real, and hence the kind of metaphor of portrait, which mm. is so so old a metaphor we don't even notice it anymore. Mm. Uh, but you know, Vasari, in front of each life of the artist, there's a portrait of the artist. Mm. Uh, and Joyce has a portrait of the artist, which isn't a picture. Uh, so I think. Uh, the question of whether videos, et cetera, interfere with this didn't just start 30 years ago. Um, uh, it started when, uh, at the beginning, when portraiture was something that uh, could be uh, a likeness or could be a bunch of words. Um, Franklin writes fake diary entries, so <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> Excellent. And they're very good. Um, in, um, he publishes a... Uh, Craven Street Gazette about his life in London. 
And the <laughs> papers of Benjamin Franklin signs off on this being the best account of his domestic life, even though they're fake, right? <laughs> um, I, I know of all his portraits where he, he was involved, they're very posed. So we have this example here, you know, the contemplative pose, mm -hmm. the bust of Newton. It's almost overdone, and a lot of his portraits are like that. He's very, you know, I want this and this and this and this. There's only one image of him where they kind of caught him. <laughs> and this is a famous fur cap portrait in France um, when he arrives, having said he almost died at sea, kind of beaten up and wearing this cap. And somebody sketches him, and it creates a portrait that I think um, probably is the one he couldn't control. It's charming. Um, mm. But the other ones are a little bit suspect, I think. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Howard Gardner from Cambridge. This is a big question. I'm sure it's on other people's minds as well. And it's, I think, directed particularly to the Princeton colleagues. <laughs> to what extent are we hearing a universal story as opposed to uh, 20th and 21st century post-Freudian mm -hmm. uh, views? If we were in China, let's say, which certainly has an aesthetic and literary tradition, including things we would call poetry and novels. Would this be something that would resonate, or is it a story that uh, males like us are telling nowadays, but is not particularly relevant elsewhere and for other demographies? So, mm -hmm. Sorry if this is impertinent, but no, it's I think it's question. important to address it. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Princeton, question. <laughs> It's not impertinent, but I don't know no. how to answer. <laughs> no, I don't know the answer. But, but I, do th I do think... An, uh, an, 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 uh, I'm not from Princeton. No. <laughs> not, you know, <laughs> there you go. He said Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I do think uh, that, that, your, that your, your, your presentation of what you were doing in, uh, articulates the same mm -hmm. question, let's mm -hmm. say, in a way, mm -hmm. that, where there is a master, let's say, the story of Texas. Mm -hmm. There is a story that, that we, we all signed up to mm -hmm. until we learn not to. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. most of us are still learning mm -hmm. that about many very different stories. And I think it's a great question, Howard. The, 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 yeah. But well, I'm not sure. I think you would have to be somebody else to answer it, though. <laughs> Hi, uh, Nili Cohen, uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, my question uh, refers primarily to you, Yves Alain. Uh, you mentioned Bart, uh, Roland Bart, and I understand that uh, you were his student. Was, what, an yeah. on, what an honor for Bart and for mm. you. <laughs> and um, uh, one of his uh, most famous uh, dicta was uh, referred to the death of the writer, the death of the author, and uh, it applies mainly to literary interpretation, uh, namely uh, the understanding that the interpretation of the reader replaces the original interpretation of the author. Does it apply also to artistic interpretation? Does the uh, researcher of art works replaces the intention of the painter, of the sculptor? Well, it's never, it's never, com never a complete replacement, <laughs> but uh, certainly plays a, plays a bigger role in, let's say, in the 20th century way of our looking at works of art than, let's say, than in the 19th century. So it's, it has a, there, was a, there was a shift, certainly on the notion of what the, what the beholder, what is the power of the beholder, what, what the interpretation of the builder brings to the work, and how it transforms the work, and how the work is not the same after that. So the, the, but there's a, there's a moment where that, where that becomes theorized, con more conscious than before, and I think it's at least 20th century. Duchamp is probably the person who brought that in directly to the, dis to the discourse about art. Hi, Mark Thompson, uh, uh, New York and London. Um, I guess a question to Leonard, and really it's about the, the first first person plural. Um, Shakespeare's writing, I guess, these plays principally not as text to be, to be read alone, what a, what a wonderful pleasure that is, but to be performed where the, the, the receiver, the, the I, is hearing public language in a public space and it's I in the, in the crowd and quite often, particularly with great performances where 
we all laugh or we're all surprised. It's we. Um, we have an experience. That, I guess my question really is, is when we think about we and us and Shakespeare, is that, a, in, in terms of, 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 of your book and your take, is that something which is kind of obvious and we need to get away from uh, we as anonymous, das man, familiar, the deeper encounter, the, the solitary one, is, is it a complication or is, is it an enriching thought? That's a wonderful question. Um, and it really puts some things in focus for me that I, <clears throat> I don't think I focused on. Um, I think... Um, We've gone through, and I uh, certainly did, and I talk about it a, a little bit in the, in the Midsummer Night's Dream chapter, we've, we've gone through a proper uh, indoctrination or, re, or, or uh, de-indoctrination uh, from thinking of Shakespeare's works as sublime poems and being reminded that they are uh, all the things that make them uh, uh, living in their own time, that they're in, that not only that they were theater pieces, but that they were available to uh, multitudes, uh, that they weren't, uh, it's not, uh, you know, Keats and Browning, uh, you know, it's, it's a language that uh, produced, that thousands of people uh, uh, listened to. Um, I, I think, um, I, I think that, that has sort of become a given, and um, I wanted to reanalyze the readerly experience. Um, uh, in the Midsummer Night's Dream chapter, I talk, I talk about performing, and my own experience uh, performing, uh, and my own experience with Shakespeare and an audience. <clears throat> um, I guess, for the most part, I'm sort of going back to the textual Shakespeare, uh, the textual and, um, you know, uh, canon canonized greatest writer of all time, Shakespeare. Uh, uh, and I think the plays I, I talk a lot about, like Lear and Hamlet and, and The Dream, uh, you know, are partly there because of their uh, overwhelming canonical status. And that my direction for in interrogating that uh, is not so much uh, the, the, the sort of the reminder that they are uh, theater pieces and available to a multitude as this sense of what, this, what is the readerly experience um, uh, that has been the model for, uh, in many ways, certainly in my education, for any kind of readerly experience of materials from the past. Um, uh, and you know, where is, uh, how has the reader been uh, uh, sort of left out or limited too far in, 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 uh, in what was legitimate uh, by, that, by that sort of notion of reading? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm supposed to recognize it. One, one, one last right. question. One right. last question, perhaps, yeah. if we could. Uh, Good question. The confessions? So what happens to us if we don't know? Augustine? What happens to us if we don't know? What about don't know. Augustine? Um, I would, I that's, well, that's, a, that's a conventional I mean, answer. Yeah. But I, I'll tell you my be... reading list. I mean, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, I mean, there are classical works. They don't call themselves autobiographies, but that are, uh, you know, the sort of first-person writings like Ovid on the Black Sea, you know, like the, um, uh, the Tristia, uh, Marcus Aurelius. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, the sort good. of first-person often lament at length, often in prose, not in the case of Ovid. Um, so, I mean, the, the sense of, and I'm sure that uh, just my ignorance not to go back earlier than, than mm. Rome and Latin, <clears throat> but certainly the, the wish to tell a story, particularly about one's own suffering or else one's own <clears throat> maturation, goes back a long way. St. Augustine wrote it? Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, I think now it, we're in the that, that would be the, yeah, I mean, we'll St. Augustine, I think, would be a point of reference when it, that, we, right. that we would recognize, then, yeah. but, that, but I bet there are quite a few yeah. early ones along, oh, yeah, sure. along the lines and, of that. Well, Christian. and outside the Western tradition. And outside outside the, the Western tradition. tradition. Right. In, in Egypt, yeah. maybe. And, and maybe that, there are scrolls in, yeah. in, in the In the sense of Christianity interested in the individual soul. I mean, that's where Augustine sort of hooks on to this, is that his stealing 
you know, pears, you know, they didn't go to Fairway for it, but p pulled them off a tree. Um, uh, that, that, who the hell cares, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, but that, that this is the building of a soul, and everybody has one. God cares. Uh, and when yeah. that, in whatever way that is instantiated, uh, then the story, there is the story to tell that, the, uh, that deserves to be told yeah. about, you know, myself. That's great. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists for sort of wonderful talks and leaving us with so many things to think about that we may never recover. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs>